So today I'm expected to talk about uh, the future of medicine, and I hope that that slide is showing someplace. I can't tell if it is or not. There we go. Um, this is a very wide topic, and it makes me very nervous to think about pronouncing on the future, because it makes me think back to when I was a kid, just when I was graduating from high school, and this is a picture that I saw about the future in Mechanics Illustrated, showing how we should all now be living this very year in a big climate-controlled dome and driving around in cars at 250 miles an hour, all controlled by a central computer. And of course, this turns out to be totally wrong. Uh, our climate has gotten out of control, not under control. And our cars are actually going slower than they were in 1968 because the traffic has become much worse because we haven't developed the infrastructure at all. So trying to predict far in the future presupposes that one understands not only the technology but also the human willpower to put that technology to use. And the truth of the matter is that the two are inseparable. And that no matter what science does and no matter what technology does, if we don't have the correct structures, the correct political structures and economic structures and social structures to put that to use, then it is all for naught. So what I would like to do this afternoon is to focus my attention uh, on one particular area uh, of medicine where we have great knowledge and which is also of great pressing need and where we can look at least a little bit in the future at a more reasonable type of scale and make some predictions. And in particular, I want to talk about the issue of HIV AIDS. And the reason that this is so important is because we now have a new futuristic type of approach to HIV AIDS, which I'll be telling you about really for the first time in public this afternoon. And it's the idea of using the body's own bacteria, microorganisms that are within all of us, to fight against this very deadly virus. Now, why is this an issue? Well, you probably all know that HIV is a relatively new disease. It came about only in the 1920s or 30s, but has now spread to the entire world. Every country in the world has HIV AIDS. It has it at high rates, and it's a continuing epidemic. We all know that in certain areas of the world, in Africa, for example, the rates are exorbitant. Uh, many percent of the population are infected, but infection in continues to occur all throughout the world, including in developed areas like the United States, where the actual rate of infection is actually back on the increase once again after a decline, especially in certain populations. So this is a deadly disease. Uh, there's some interesting new research that suggests that some of the initial spread was actually brought about by medical practices uh, done by Europeans in Africa early on, and so it's a perfectly good example of that interaction between technology and science. So where is the current state of HIV medicine? Well, the first thing that we know is that we now understand that AIDS is caused by a virus called HIV, and we understand a huge amount about this virus. We know everything about this virus, more than we know about any other organism that has ever been studied. And through science, we have also developed truly miraculous drugs, the antiretroviral drugs, which completely stop the virus from developing into AIDS. So nobody needs to die from HIV anymore. We have drugs that stop it in its track, and those drugs are now available as a single pill, once a day, at a low, very reasonable price, only a dollar a day. Uh, science has actually technologically conquered HIV AIDS. But what we don't have is we have no way of preventing the disease. We have no biomedical remedy. We have no vaccine, for example. The best that we can do is to tell people to wear condoms, or in the United States, uh, our government doesn't even support that. And we tell people, don't have sex. We tell teenagers, don't have sex with one another. Needless to say, uh, not a very good solution. So how can we use science to develop a better prevention against HIV? Well, it all starts with understanding the biology of the virus. We have to understand the basic science and understand that the way that HIV gets into people 
through sexual intercourse, sexually at least, is by penetrating through the epithelial layer of the vagina. And this is actually rather difficult. Uh, the vagina is fairly well protected, but if it is inflamed or if it is thinned at all, uh, it can occur much more readily. And again, another example of technology gone a bit wild is the fact that one of the most common birth controls that's used in Africa in particular actually enhances that uh, HIV infection, as some of you may have seen recently. So here's the interesting part. It turns out that the vagina, like all of our mucosal surfaces, is coated by bacteria. And these are normal or healthy bacteria. They're actually good for your normal health. And in fact, if you get rid of those bacteria, you're much more susceptible to infections of various sorts, vaginitis, and other things. But these bacteria don't protect you against HIV. Otherwise, people wouldn't be infected. So the idea is, why not, in a futuristic way, take these bacteria out of the body, genetically engineer them so that they can fight HIV, and then put them back into the body. So it's sort of like genetic engineering, but it's not on you, it's on something that lives inside of you. And that's the basic idea. Well, good science can do that. So first of all, we have to develop a host. We have to develop a bacterium that we can use. There's a great bacterium called lactobacillus. And lactobacillus is a natural inhabitant of the vagina. It's good for the vagina. It keeps the pH nice and low around pH 4. It fights off other types of infections. It fights off vaginitis. In fact, um, if women have vaginitis, you can get uh, these bacteria in an easy suppository form uh, that can be very useful. And we also need something that will inhibit HIV. Well, again, science has been very good. We know the entire structure of HIV, and we now have many different molecules, little tiny molecules, big molecules, all types of molecules that can stop this virus from infecting. And we use one called cyanovirin. It's actually a cell protein from a, a bacterium that lives in the ocean, and it happens to bind to the sugar groups on HIV and keeps it from infecting. So using science, it was a fairly straightforward matter to put the cyanovirin into the bacteria, put the bacteria back into its host, into the vagina, and have it work in that way. So here is the experiment that was done to test this, is that we took macaques or animals, because you don't want to test something the first time in humans, obviously. We took the bacteria that contained the HIV inhibitor, and we inserted those into the vagina and let them grow. And then once that was done, the animals were challenged uh, with a virus to see whether they were protected or not. Okay, so here's what happens when you do that. You might think you put foreign bacteria into a person's vagina, they're going to reject it immediately, it'll just get flushed down the toilet or whatever. But it turns out this bacteria loves to grow in the vagina. And in fact, it grows there not just for a day or two, but for one week or two weeks or three weeks or six weeks, and grows at very high levels and actually becomes the predominant bacteria within the vagina. As it's doing that, it continues to secrete this anti-HIV peptide into the vaginal area. And that's shown by that slide on the left where you see a lot of black bands. Those are black bands of the protein that is coming out and being secreted into the vagina of the animals. If you look at that little picture on the right, you can actually see the bacteria clustered around a vaginal epithelial cell. So the bacteria love this environment. It's just the right pH. There's lots of nutrients within that vaginal space. And the bacteria grow not quite as well as on a Petri plate, but very well. And then if you look at that lower slide, you'll see that we can actually stain uh, with molecular stains to look and see whether the protein is coming out. And indeed, now the whole vaginal lumen is coated with what looks brown there, which is in fact a protective layer of cyanovirin protein, a protein that uh, protects animals uh, and people against HIV. So does this have any efficacy or not? Does it actually protect? Now, often in laboratories, people will infect an animal with a very high dose of virus uh, because that's an easy thing to do, it's an easy experiment, and see if you get protection. But in real life, it's important to realize that HIV is a very inefficient virus. And in a typical sexual encounter, 
The person might only uh, encounter a few viruses, only one of which is likely to get through. <clears throat> and so it was very important in this type of science to use a similar situation in the test situation in the experimental laboratory. So we actually, instead of infecting the animals once, we infected them every week as if the person were having sex every week with somebody who was infected, and then looked over time to see if there was any protection or not. And indeed, there was protection. So animals that have not been protected or that have bacteria that do not have the cyanovirin are infected at a rate of about 35% each time. So each time there's a sexual encounter, or in this case, an encounter with a syringe, there's about a 30% chance of getting infected. But the animals shown in black who are protected with a lactobacillus have a greatly reduced chance of getting infected down to about 13% per exposure. And if you look at the slide on the right and break down the different groups, we can get even larger amounts of protection by making sure that we look only at the animals where the lactobacillus has taken hold. And in that case, there's up to 90% protection as compared to the controls. So the answer from all this is that, yes, you can make a bacteria, it protects against HIV, uh, or in SHIV in this case, uh, and does it fairly effectively. Even for the animals that are infected eventually, uh, because if you keep on putting in virus every single week for an infinite period of time, everyone will get infected eventually. Even for those animals, the amount of virus that's present is lowered by about a factor of 10. So it's about 10% 10, 10 as much virus as you would have uh, if you didn't have this particular protection. And that may be because uh, the bacteria continue to resist the growth of the virus even as it's beginning to replicate. All right, so now we come to the part where we have to talk about the interaction between the science and the delivery. We have to talk about the interaction between the science and the medical establishment, the pharmaceutical establishment, and all of the different factors that control whether or not a drug is available to the people who actually need it the most. So probably for this type of treatment, which would be necessary for virtually everyone in the world, it needs to be very easy to use, it needs to be inexpensive, and it needs to have a long shelf life. Uh, because after all, most people in the world don't have access to a clinic or a doctor uh, or uh, sophisticated medical technologies like we do in a place like Spain or in the United States. And so fortunately, this is quite easy for bacteria because you can dry them. And you can take the bacteria, grow them in huge amounts in a GMP factory, dry them down into a pellet, put them into a suppository or into something that's taken orally, uh, and make huge amounts of these. And this is very cheap. It's like growing cattle feed, for example, um, uh, remarkably inexpensive. So just from a sort of scientific point of view, this is an idea that works very well. First of all, because it's controlled by women. Most types of prevention, most infections are now happening in women uh, throughout the world. And yet most of the control mechanisms we have are forced by men, uh, condom use, for example. It's important for women to have control themselves. It's transparent, no one knows that you're using it. It lasts a long time, at least a month between menses. It's cheap and it's easy to store and distribute. Um, there are still many issues that need to be resolved and looked at very carefully. Issues of safety, after all, this is a GMP organism which, we're now, which women would be putting into themselves. Uh, and then, of course, questions of access and control, who controls all this technology. So all of this is to say that with science, we can make a type of prevention of HIV now that is reasonable in real world terms, that is protective, that is accessible, that is controlled by the people who need to control it, in this case, women, uh, and that uh, can be distributed in a relatively straightforward manner. But again, the question is, what will make for good medicine? And it takes more than just this science and technology it also takes the delivery mechanisms that are controlled not by scientists, but by pharmaceutical companies in the United States, uh, by governments in many other parts of the world, by the forces of commerce, by the forces of government, and by a variety of other forces. And this is where there has been a real breakdown in HIV AIDS and in many other areas of health. Because if you look at the case of HIV AIDS, 
We've developed these wonderful drugs that stop the progression of the disease. There's no reason medically why anybody should die of AIDS in this year. And yet if you look worldwide, only 5% of the people that are infected with the virus are actually being treated. 95% of people are not getting treatment and they most likely will eventually die of this disease. So where is the fall down? <clears throat> Part of it is because of the global discrepancy between North and South. Um, a difficult topic to address, one that people have been concerned about a long time, but there are issues of health infrastructure that can't be easily accessed at this time. But many of the problems, in fact, are much more accessible and much more manageable. And they are problems with intellectual property protection and the biopharmaceutical companies insisting that they have complete protection. They are problems with manufacture and the fact that only certain processes are allowed. And they are basically problems with control. So that companies in the United States, for example, want to control the flow of drugs. They have manipulated our government into supporting them in doing so. And this has made the delivery and the price of drugs still inaccessible in many cases. So these are really issues that need to be addressed at the top of the list, not at the bottom. And we can amplify this for virtually every other disease that we think of. So I think really that the future of medicine is going to depend very much, not just on scientists like myself, but on politicians, uh, on uh, capitalists, on the people that run the biopharmaceutical industry, and ultimately on the people themselves to demand that the technology and the science solutions that we come up with are applicable to everybody. So I'd just like to thank the many collaborators that have worked in my laboratory at the National Institutes of Health on these issues. Uh, we've collaborated with a biotech company called Ocell and many other people have been involved. And um, that is my presentation. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the conversation that's to come. Thank you. Thank you.